Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. What you see here on the bench, obviously, is the TRS-80 Model 2. Yeah, it's the machine that I worked on quite a bit on a previous video series, which of course I'll a link in the description down below. The machine was left for dead, had leaves inside, tons of bug debris and who knows what. And I can't believe that it actually, well, it kind of came back to life and it looks um, in pretty good shape actually. This machine has been back so to speak, because due to a shoulder issue that I had recently, well, over the last year or so, meant that moving this thing around was quite a bit of a chore due to the fact that it weighs so much. So I pretty much just had this slid off to the back uh, of the basement down here on a cart, so I didn't have to lift it. And unfortunately, after all that repair work and fixing, there's actually something wrong with this machine. Now, I want to get back to doing a repair video where I get this thing fully working. And thanks to viewer Kevin, who recently donated a TRC Model 1 to the channel as well, I will be able to try to repair this thing. I have a partially made video where I show this machine malfunctioning. And unfortunately, I never really finished it because I wanted to actually do some troubleshooting and fixing in that video while I was never able to figure out any of the issues with this machine other than it doesn't work. I think at this point, or at least where I left off, is it would just crash no matter what operating system I was loading, whether it's TRS, DOS, or any other operating system as well. There's like CPMs and other types of DOS for this machine. The reason why we have this on the bench here right now is because with the diagnostic ROM that I showed off for the TRS-80 Model 3 on a recent repair video, and also that ROM works on the Model 1, well, David, who did a lot of the programming for that diagnostic ROM, has come up with a version that should actually work on this Model 2. Now, we haven't actually tested the ROM that he came up with on anything but an emulator, so we really have no idea if it can actually work on real hardware. Why don't I spin this around and take the cover off, and while I do, I will talk about some architectural differences between this machine and the Model 1 slash 3. So yes, this machine has the Model 2 moniker, right? So you think it kind of comes after the Model 1 and before the Model 3. Well, that is the case, but Radio Shack really positioned this machine, instead of as a home computer, as a business computer. So it was very expensive. Just want to make sure I don't lose, lose these screws. It was very expensive. And while this Model 2 has a Z80 architecture, just like on the Model 1 and the Model 3, this thing has some major improvements with it. Now, I think I talked about some of those on the series for this machine. So if you've watched it, uh, then you should know some of that stuff, or maybe you're familiar with these machines anyways. Now, if I turn this here, you'll see, whoops, oh, just slid off the table there. Come on, don't do that. If I turn this, oh, just slid off again. <laughs> if I turn this, you can see that uh, the architecture of this has these cards in a chassis here. And of course, there's a processor card, a RAM board, a disk controller, stuff like that. There are room for other cards as well. You can expand this up to a theoretical maximum of 512K. Although, with the fact that there aren't as many card slots as is possible, because the RAM boards are 64K each, well, obviously, 64K each, you're going to need more of those cards than are possible to plug into this machine. But I think Radio Shack was thinking ahead a little bit and maybe thought that this architecture would be more popular over the long run and maybe someone would come up with a higher density card, like say a 256K card, where then you could easily upgrade this. We have a giant eight inch disk drive and it looks like I stuck various chips and stuff in here. In fact, I don't really remember if this machine is working. TRS-80 Model 2. Oh, that's the Terminator for the disk drive there. Uh, because there's a bunch of chips in here, I wonder if I, in my diagnostics, was chip swapping and stuff, because a lot of the stuff is socketed on here, to try and figure out what the problem is, and maybe I left this in a completely non-working state. It's been a long time since I've worked on this. Now back to this video, what I really want to do here is not do troubleshooting and try to fix this computer. I just want to try out the diagnostic ROM on here to see if it works. And I figured it'd be kind of fun to make a video doing that so you could all see whether it worked or not. And I suppose I will release or not release this video if the ROM works and maybe then David could make some changes to the ROM to try to fix it and stuff like that. And at the end of this, if the ROM works, then, of course, we'll be releasing it on my GitHub repo, 
So I will put links in the description below to that. So if you have a Model 2 or potentially any of the other machines that are based on this architecture, like the 16 and the 16B and I think the 6000 maybe, is that also on this? I don't, I don't remember. Then theoretically that diagnostic ROM may work on those as well. All right, so what I need to do is take off this bracket here so I can <laughs> uh, take these cards out because I need to look at them, see what the heck I've done and have I ruined things by taking chips out and forgetting what I did exactly. I don't think that's the case, but you never know. All right, I can see here that this is the RAM card right there, and I don't think I've done anything to that, so I'm going to leave that in there. Then we have this board right here, which is the floppy drive controller, and also I think the parallel port, and that's what this cable is here. It's just not plugged in, but this cable right here is the ribbon cable that goes to the floppy drive. Next up, there are two more cards. One is going to be the CPU card, which I think is also the serial port. Now, this one right here, I can tell, is obviously the display controller, because it has some video RAM right here, has a character ROM. It also is the keyboard controller. Um, this cable here is what goes to the monitor, but this one is for the front keyboard connector. Everything looks to be inserted on here. So I'm gonna just put this temporarily right there because we're gonna uh, need to put that back in. And then this card here, this is the reset connection on there. This is the CPU card and there it is, it's got the uh, Z80 CPU, some other ICs, and it has the ROM chip, and that's what I'm gonna be replacing with the diagnostic ROM. Alrighty, I have all the cards back in here because I do just wanna power this machine on and see if it at least is showing signs of life right now, because I haven't used it in so long. Who knows, maybe this has failed in such a bad way that it doesn't even try to boot up. The CPU card and the stock ROM that's on there actually has some very rudimentary diagnostics that run at power on. But the bad thing about it is it only tests the very first 32K of RAM and not even all of that because the ROMs are shadowing part of the RAM down at the bottom. I can't remember, it's like 4K of it, I think. And besides it leaving off parts of RAM, it's a very primitive RAM test as well. It does test some of the other components on here like the floppy controller and some other stuff. But let's just see if this thing even shows a sign of life and tries to boot before I put the diagnostic ROM in here. All right, I've connected the mains power to the back. See what happens here. But sounds like it's working. So that's what it should do. It should try to uh, load there. And yeah, boot error, DC. Okay, that's disk controller. And it's telling us that because there is no floppy disk in there. Now, if I hit the reset button, there we go. We get the white screen. That is totally normal. And yeah, okay. So the machine is working, working to the extent that it was working before. So let's give the diagnostic ROM a test. Now here's the CPU card. This is the ROM chip right here, this one, and it is two kilobytes in size or the equivalent of a 2716. So I'm pretty sure you can just pop a 2716 in there and it is pin compatible with this ROM chip. I'm gonna use my adapter that I've been using on all the other machines just because it will work and um, it's easier for me to program than going to find a 2716 and programming that. Because remember, by the way, 2716s that require almost always 25 volts programming voltage, maybe 21 volts. And uh, the new Mini Pros, TL866, twos or Mark II or whatever it is, cannot program those chips. They only go up to 18 volts, I think, so they are, it's insufficient. Most 2716s, like I said, require 25 volts and you're not gonna get a successful program. So using an adapter like I've been doing on all my testing means that you can use like a 2764 in a board like this and it will totally work fine. And of course, way easier to program. Okay, just like that, here is the CPU card and you can see there I have my adapter installed and there is the 2864 EE Prom in there. I really like using this. I mean, there's an adapter and yes, that's one negative, I suppose. But the fact is for me doing development work, I don't have to use the UV eraser to program this, not to mention it's very easy to program this. Anything can program it. The one thing to consider is this board might be holding some of the address lines high because they're tied to five volts. And in that case, you need to load the ROM image either into address 1000 or maybe 2000 or something like that. I'm, I'll figure that out as I do testing on this thing. <laughs> and then I will report back what works and what doesn't. So let's plug this in here and see if we have a diagnostic. All righty, I'm all ready to go. I turned off the lights because I wanna be able to see the screen more clearly in the camera. The other thing to consider is that David and I 
decided to do the beep codes by flashing the LED or the select line on the floppy drive. There's no speaker on this machine. I think there might be a beeper in the keyboard, but I actually don't think there is. And I don't even have the keyboard connected, obviously. There's no speaker in here, so there's no way to do beep codes. So flashing of the LED on here will give us an indication whether this thing is trying to run or not, especially if your monitor is not working, for instance. So let's see what happens. I'm gonna say it is not working. Oh, wait, it's totally working. Well, would you look at that? There it is, it's running the diagnostic and it's trying to test all 512K. Well, obviously I only have a single 64K card in this machine, so all the other banks are gonna report errors, but this is actually looking really good. So I forgot some of the exact technical details of what's going on here because I talked to David about this uh, a few weeks ago and uh, this has been sitting waiting for me to test it out the whole time. But there's 2K of video RAM on this machine and the address space is from F800 all the way to the top of memory space. Now that can be bank switched in and out. So anytime we need to update the screen, we actually need to swap out the top of memory and then that video RAM gets banked in. You use that an IO register to do that. And then that is able to update the screen. So he's going back and forth between having the video RAM banked in and out so he can update the, the, the screen text. And then the ROM itself also occupies, I think two or 4K down at the bottom of memory, starting at address 0000. Let's reset the machine here and take a look. So that's the video RAM test running there. So what it's doing here is it's testing the second part or the second bank of memory. I mean, I'm using the word bank in a way that Radio Shack doesn't do, but it's testing the second 16K and it's wanting to make sure that that is good. And then what it does is it can relocate part of the code from the ROM into that second bank and then it can go back and test fully that first bank. And David's work there with an emulator was successful and this freaking works. This is unbelievable. This is the first time right here that we're running this code on real hardware. And other than the fact, if I move this over here, that the beep code on the, the light there doesn't work. There's nothing changing at all. Um, we're gonna have to look into that. The diagnostic ROM itself though is working. So let me just reset that again. So there it is, it's running the video RAM test then it tests that second bank, then it's gonna relocate code, it tests the first bank, and then it's gonna go on to test everything else. So on my 64K RAM card, page one, banks zero and one, I guess, I don't know, I don't remember how Radio Shack calls it. That's the top half of the card, and now it's trying to test all the rest of the video or DRAM, and there's a bank switch register that it's twiddling to do that. Those cards don't even exist in my system, so clearly it's unable to test that memory, which is why it errors out. And this is freaking awesome. Absolutely freaking awesome. So the diagnostic ROM appears to be working perfectly, except for that flashing floppy drive LED, which I really like just in case the machine has a non-working display, you can tell at least it's executing code. So David went ahead and he modified the ROM for me. And this is it loaded into the mini pro right here. And now when I program this, it should have hopefully flashing floppy drive LED and the heads. It seemed like uh, the original way this was working was it was selecting the disk drive. That obviously wasn't doing anything. So we changed tactics to not only selecting the drive, but also loading the heads, which is kind of what the stock ROM does when you first uh, turn on the computer and it starts to try to boot the floppy drive. Boy, I think I've bent these pins a little bit. This don't go right into this adapter. There we go. So there it is. Uh, yeah, so it should flash the LED three times and at the same time load the head, which is that solenoid sound you hear when you power on the Model 2. So I gotta say, I'm glad I used Deoxit in the past on these slot connectors because they were very stiff. And now with a lot of Deoxit on there, the cards go in much more easily. This is the reset switch. Just connect that back up. Keep an eye on the floppy drive LED, which is right here on this particular Model 2. When I power this on, hopefully that flashes three times and we should hear the accompanying clunk of the head loading and unloading. Here we go. There it goes. Three flashes during the memory test there. Now, maybe we should switch it to two flashes. I don't know, but that completely works well. And there it is, the diagnostic is actually running. Let's just reset this. 
there it goes flashing the LED. So if you're using this diagnostic ROM and you put it in your machine and you get no video, but you get the flashing uh, LED on the floppy drive, that implies that the CPU card is A, executing code, and B, that the floppy controller is working good enough at least to control the floppy drive. This test is entirely stackless. That means very specifically that it does not rely on a processor stack, which requires working DRAM. So this diagnostic will work perfectly without the RAM board. In fact, let's just give that a test. I'm gonna pull the RAM board out of this computer and here it is. Let's see if it actually works without this in there because it should actually. There it goes, flashing the LED. And we should have the RAM desk work, but everything is gonna not work. So yeah, uh, no working memory. Of course, the video RAM is on the video card and that works. Uh, we have 2K of it right there. If I pull the video card out, I guess I should try that. If I pull that out, the floppy drive should actually still do its clicky clicky thing. So let's see, which is the actual video card? It's this one here. All right, I don't wanna unplug all the wires, but take my word for it that it is currently hanging out the back of the computer right now. And so there will be nothing on the screen. Ah, it is not working. How interesting is that? Okay, well, I'll have to report this to David. I'm gonna pop the card, the video card back in, and we should expect to have a fully working computer again, except of course, there is no working dynamic RAM on this machine, but I wanted to demonstrate that the uh, diagnostic ROM, there we go, it is all in there. The diagnostic ROM does not actually require working RAM. And there it is, it looks better without the lights on, so you can see this a little more clearly. Now you might be wondering why it's skipping bank zero there, or this first chunk of memory from zero, 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 zero to three FFF. The reason why is because the ROM partially occupies that part of memory on this machine. So to fully test that bank of RAM, there needs to be a working bank of memory right here starting at 4,000. What happens is the ROM relocates part of its code into that bank, then it's able to fully test this first bank. And I'm, I'm calling it banks or pages, I don't know, I'm always mixing it up, but I would call that the very first 16K of memory on the machine. Since it doesn't have this extra part of memory here, there is no way for this test to actually properly test that. So we're actually just skipping that test entirely. Now keep in mind that the base minimum configuration of RAM on this machine is 32K, which would imply you would have both of these zero banks available or page zero available. So if there were no errors in the second part of it, the second bank of page zero, trying to get my terminology right, then it would fully test that first bank right there. But like I said, the card is removed, so there is no memory to even load the code into so it can test that first bank, so it just skips it. That's a really slick piece of logic, David. I didn't actually know you did that. And of course you'll be watching this video. So <laughs> that is really, really cool. So I was just watching the Trash Talk podcast tonight and uh, they actually mentioned this diagnostic ROM, the version that's for the Model 1 and the Model 3. But they mentioned that uh, someone is working on a new card for this machine that actually will have a full 512K of RAM. So this diagnostic test will show all of that RAM, well it should show all of that RAM working. Couple little caveats are, uh, that card has an option to allow you to keep this original 64K card in uh, the page zero if you want. And the official Tandy hard drive controller actually uses, I think page F here, some of this for RAM on the hard drive controller. So it adds some more RAM. I don't know what the use of that is. This test should detect that down here if that card was installed, but that 512K card that's being developed, which incidentally is very small, has one single SRAM chip for 512K. It can leave those two banks or pages available so the original cards can use them, but the rest of this will all be filled in. Anyhow, there we have it. This is a short little video. That is the new TRS-80 Model 2 diagnostic ROM running on this machine. It may work on the 16, 16B and the Tandy 6000, at least in Z80 mode. Of course, I do not have those machines, so there's no way for me to test that. But if you are watching this and you have one of those machines, please feel free to download this ROM and let us know if it's working. 
And with that, that is going to be it for this video. Thumbs up if you liked it. You know what to do if you didn't. And uh, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. It really helps me out. And um, I have more Tandy stuff coming in this month of September. It's kind of like a... Uh, it was unintentional, to be honest, that Septandy uh, was going to be a thing for me. I never know what videos I'm going to be making. It just kind of happens. And it just turned out that I'm making a bunch of Tandy videos or Radio Shack TRS-80 videos. So um, thanks to my patrons as well. And comment down below if you have any thoughts about this project. And that is going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. And I will see you next time. Bye.